Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This day in sports history. It's March 27th, and just like yesterday, I'm trying my best to fill that college basketball void for you between the opening rounds and the Sweet 16 with as much basketball as you can handle. And all the excitement that you just experienced this weekend and all of the great games, performances, game-winning shots you've watched over the last however many years can be traced back to 1939. On this day, it was the championship game of the first NCAA basketball tournament. It was the Oregon Webfoots against the Ohio State Buckeyes in the national championship game in Evanston, Illinois. Side note, while Oregon would be mostly known as the Ducks over the years, they would not officially be known as the Ducks until 1978. Anyway, the Webfoots won 46-33 to become the first NCAA champions. So this was an eight-team field. In addition to Oregon and Ohio State, there was Brown, Wake Forest, Villanova, Oklahoma, Texas, and Utah State. And they started out in two different regions to determine the best college basketball team in 1939. It remained an eight-team field until 1950, when it began to expand. But if you remember from yesterday, there really was not a consensus national champ until the NCAA started playing the NIT champion. If you recall from yesterday's edition, in 1945, there was a playoff between the NCAA and NIT champs to determine a consensus champion. That actually started in 1943, when the NCAA tournament began encroaching on NIT territory and playing its national title games in New York's Madison Square Garden. Because here's the thing, the NIT had more prestige because it played in New York. In fact, this first edition of the NCAA tournament lost about $2,500, but thankfully they realized they had something special and decided to come back for year two in 1940. That one made money, and the National Association of Basketball Coaches, who ran the first two tournaments, turned the running of the tournament over to the NCAA, and from there, it's grown into the 68-team field that we have today and enjoy as March Madness. And switching gears now to baseball, and on this day in 1902, the Chicago Daily News coined the nickname Cubs for the first time for their local baseball team. They had been the White Stockings, then they were known as the Colts, and then after Cap Anson, a.k.a. Pop, left the team, they became the Orphans. But on this day, the Daily News started calling the team the Cubs because they had a lot of young players. And I can't be the only one happy that that one called on instead of Orphans. And in 2006... The NFL owners voted unanimously to brand the official Wilson football used in games the Duke after former New York Giants owner Wellington Mara. Mara had passed away the previous October, and this was a tribute to a man who had impacted the game over 60-plus years. He joined the Giants' front office in 1940. He took over as owner in 1959 and continued on until his death in 2006. He was nicknamed the Duke by New York players in the 40s because he had been named after the Duke of Wellington. And today's non-sports did you know? The Hartford Current in Connecticut is the oldest continuously running newspaper in the United States. It was first published in 1764. That's all for today. I'll have more tomorrow on This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Sweet production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network 
and we're able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.